everyone, and welcome to the OKS Computer YouTube channel. My name is Patrick, and we're back at the record shelf because I have a tradition and I'm going to stick to it. This is part five in an ongoing series of videos talking about the records in my record collection that I've acquired over the past few years. Uh, this is part five, and so if you have not seen those first four parts that go from A to I, they are linked in the description, and I highly recommend you check those out. A lot of great albums in those first few parts, but we're just going to pick up right where we left off, uh, going into the J's. We have Jethro Tull with Aqualung. Now, I talked about, I believe it was in part three, uh, when I talked about Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, that there was a time in my life that I loved classic progressive rock from the 60s and 70s. You know, your Rush, Yes, Genesis, King Crimson, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. And Aqualung was one of my favorite albums to listen to uh, during that time. And so when I found it at one of my favorite local record stores, and it was a very low price, I figured it would be a great addition to the collection. Uh, my favorite thing about this here is this wonderful gatefold painting here. It's very, very intricate, and it goes to show that even though these albums were made so long ago, Jethro Tull put so much care and detail into their packaging. And uh, that was not the only time they did that, because that also goes for Thick as a Brick, and uh, this is my favorite work of theirs. Is it a song? Is it an album? I'm not really sure. It's a single 43-minute composition split on two sides of a vinyl. Uh, they market it as an album, uh, so I consider it to be an album. Uh, it's supposed to be a satire, a parody of a concept album, and they go so far into that concept that they made an entire newspaper uh, detailing all these different fake articles that I believe the band made themselves. And that's not just the cover here. If you open it up, you can see there are multiple pages worth of fake articles here. I have yet to read all of them, but I am just amazed by this. I have no idea how they came up with this, how they did this, but I love it. And it's worth getting uh, just for the newspaper alone. Uh, if you are new to Jethro Tull and if you're looking to uh, get into their work, I suggest you check out Aqualung and then definitely give Thick as a Brick a listen. It's a wonderful track. All right, next up we have uh, more classics here. We have three albums by the Jimi Hendrix Experience. Uh, first up, Are You Experienced? Uh, their first, my favorite. Uh, then we have Axis Bold as Love, and this one has a really cool uh, vertical gatefold, kind of like what Blonde on Blonde did in one of the earlier videos. And then we also have uh, Electric Ladyland, and I wanted to specifically highlight Electric Ladyland because uh, this is one of the first ones that I ever got in the collection. And uh, at the time that I purchased this, I think I only had like eight or ten albums, and uh, I did not know that color vinyl existed, uh, so when I saw that it was this deep shade of purple, I was amazed by it. I didn't know that this was possible. And so this was the album that uh, sparked an interest in color vinyl. I didn't know it was possible. And so I was trying to get as many of those as I possibly could. And I've gotten uh, several more since then, but it all started with this one. Great album. Uh, next up, more classics. We have Billy Joel's The Stranger. Now, Billy Joel is uh, he's an excellent uh, pianist, songwriter, singer, performer. Uh, the man does it all. He is so talented. And The Stranger is my favorite album of his. It has all my favorite tracks of his, uh, specifically uh, Vienna, Scenes from an Italian Restaurant, Moving Out. Uh, the whole thing is just pretty much spotless. And so if you're into uh, Billy Joel and if you're into vinyl, uh, The Stranger is one that I highly suggest that you add to the collection. It sounds spectacular on vinyl. Uh, this next one is weird. Uh, it's Journey's Frontiers. Now, I don't actually like this album that much. I'm not really a Journey fan, uh, but I remember I was at my, my grandparents' house a few years ago, uh, and they have a sizable vinyl collection, but they never listened to any of them, and so they said, if you're looking to add some to your collection, uh, feel free to take one of these. And so I just, I picked out Frontiers by Journey. And uh, listening back to it, it's very much an 80s album. It sounds like the most quintessentially loud arena rock 80s thing that you can imagine. And uh, it's not bad at all. I mean, it's got Separate Ways, Worlds Apart, which is a song that I really like. But uh, as a whole, I'm not a huge fan of the album. I mostly just see it as, you know, a gift, an artifact of its time. And I'm, I'm really excited to have it uh, for that reason, uh, even though I'm not a big fan of the music itself. All right, now for something completely different. Uh, we have JPEG Mafia's Black Ben Carson. Yeah, that's that's a shift in direction. But yeah, I love JPEG Mafia. And uh, this is not my favorite album of his. Personally, I'm more into veteran All My Heroes Are Cornballs, even some of the older stuff like the Ghost Pop tape. 
But still, when I heard that he was reissuing Black Ben Carson on a huge uh, triple LP, I knew that I had to have it because it's a wonderful album. And uh, it has a really cool alternate cover art of, uh, I believe this is a concert of his. And uh, we open it up. It has a really cool uh, close-up picture of, uh, I believe that's Peggy. I love the black and white photography that's all over this package. It's wonderful stuff. And uh, if you're into, you know, some of the, I don't know, middle of the road uh, Peggy, like after Devon Hendricks, but before Veteran, if you're into that era of his work, I think that Black Ben Carson is about as good as it gets. It's just got a plain black vinyl, but it sounds amazing. It sounds so heavy. There are a few songs on here that I was just blown away by, by how different they sound from the Digital Master. I think that he did a great job with this uh, reissue here, and I'd love to get more of his in the collection, but I'm fine with having a Black Ben Carson for now. All right, next up, uh, we have uh, another big shift in direction. We have uh, Kira Kira Benito's Benito Generation. If you know me, you know I am a massive Kira Kira Benito fan. I love everything that they've made. Uh, they have yet to release an album or even a song that has remotely disappointed me. And uh, this is one of my favorite pop albums. It's just, it's such a vibrant, lively, joyful record. And it's just, it makes you smile. And so if you're looking for an album that makes you smile, uh, go to Benito Generation. Uh, this is uh, pretty cool how they have this poster here. I love when a vinyl comes with a poster. I have not hung this one up yet. I probably should at some point. It's pretty small, so I have space for it. But still, a very cool photo of the trio there. And uh, Sarah's in the cap and gown from the cover art. And uh, if we look at the vinyl itself, uh, so the sleeve here, it has all of the lyrics in both English and Japanese. Very nice that they did that. And uh, it's a very cool shade of blue. That's great. I love that. And uh, it's also similar to the, the cap and gown on the cover art. Yeah, this album is just spectacular. I mean, there's there's no other way to say it. Next up, uh, another wonderful album. We have uh, Kanye West and Kid Cudi, uh, Kid See Ghosts. Now, this is not my favorite album that Kanye has made. Personally, more of a fan of like the college dropout, late registration, some of the older stuff. But when it comes to like late 2010s, uh, pre-Jesus is King Kanye, uh, this thing is about as good as it gets. I love it. These two artists worked so well together. And uh, even if it is a very short and concise album, I think it's one of the best that both have made so far. And I understand that there was recently a, uh, a pink pressing or a purple pressing uh, for Record Store Day. Uh, this was just a plain black one that I got shortly after the album was first released. I wasn't looking to get another copy of it. I think I'm fine with just having one. Uh, but still... Kitsy Ghosts, I mean, what's there to be said about this album that hasn't already been said? Uh, speaking of great albums, uh, we have one of my all-time favorites, uh, In the Court of the Crimson King by King Crimson. Uh, this is an album that truly needs no introduction. I mean, these five songs uh, pretty much shaped progressive rock as we know it, and shaped my music taste as I know it. Uh, so I knew that I had to get it as soon as possible. Um, very cool gatefold here, uh, just like with uh, Jethro Tull, I think that this packaging is also very cool, very detailed, even though it was an album that was made a long time ago. The artwork associated with this album is unlike anything I've ever seen before. So yeah, I mean, In the Court of the Crimson King, uh, undeniably a classic. Uh, so bravo to King Crimson for making one of the best albums I've ever heard. All right, we've got a few albums by the same band coming up here. Uh, this is uh, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Uh, first up, this live album, Chunky Shrapnel. This was songs played on the uh, tour supporting Infest the Rat's Nest in 2019. Uh, I believe, yes, 2019. And uh, just packed full of all my favorites from that era of their work. And uh, it has a really cool medley on the D side of songs from all throughout their discography. Uh, it's called, I believe, yeah, A Brief History of Planet Earth. I was very interested in hearing that because they didn't release that uh, beforehand. So I didn't know what I was getting into, uh, but ultimately it turned out to be one of the best parts of uh, this live album. And I know that they've made a ton of live albums, uh, especially in that bootlegger series where they had like five or six that they released all in a couple of months. And uh, they gave away all the assets, said, make your own vinyl. And there are tons of copies of those on the internet. But I really think that I just want the official ones because I think that those are the strongest performances. And uh, with this one here, it uh, comes on a very cool color vinyl. And there were quite a few varieties of this. And so it was hard to choose just one but I ultimately got this uh, this green and black splatter one. I believe this was the Acid Rain variety. Looks great. Uh, King Giz have always had a knack for great vinyl packaging and great vinyl colors. And uh, Chunky Shrapnel is no exception. 
Uh, speaking of which, we got another live album of theirs. This was live in San Francisco 2016. I think that I'm fine with just having these two live albums, uh, and then I just want to get more of their studio records. But when it comes to the live albums, I think that this and Chunky Shrapnel, uh, it's really amazing stuff. Excuse me. Uh, but yeah, another one where it's really, really cool uh, vinyl pressing. Uh, it comes on this nice gray and black vinyl. I believe this was what they called recycled wax. Uh, they had a series of reissues for their catalog where they put everything on like composted recycled material. And I think that's really cool. It goes to show uh, alongside making an album like Fishing for Fishies that they care very much for the environment. I also love the, the kind of shiny cover art that they did there. Uh, it looks a lot better in person. Uh, sorry if you don't really get that here. Uh, this album does also have my favorite live rendition of the song Head on Pill from Float on Fill Your Lungs. It's like a 25 minute jam session that takes up the entire D side. And I am just... I, I, I love it so much, and this is another thing where it's worth getting just for that one song alone. And then we got two of their studio albums. Uh, we have Murder of the Universe. Now, this was that concept album that they did. It's 21 songs split into three parts, and a lot of it is spoken word. Uh, some people take an issue with that. I don't really have a problem with that, because uh, I think that it's a really cool uh, concept and story that they did with those uh, three different kind of uh, battles, the post-apocalyptic thing that they're going for with this album. I think it worked out really well. And uh, I don't care uh, about the spoken word very much. It doesn't detract from the experience for me. Um, still, though, sounds great and it looks great. That is disgustingly fantastic. I love that. Uh, it's called a vomit splatter. Uh, appropriate given the subject matter of the album, but still uh, a bit weird. Uh, still, though, uh, it does have this booklet here and it has all of the lyrics uh, to the spoken word and the sung portions, and it has all of this really complicated, intricate artwork to go with it. Uh, King Gizzard, they really go all out when it comes to, you know, both uh, making these very weird and ambitious albums and also making weird and ambitious packages. So yeah, King Gizzard, they continue to make some of the best uh, vinyl that I know of as of now. Now, that also goes for Nonagon Infinity. Now, I personally think that, like, Infest the Rat's Nest uh, is their best album. That's my favorite of theirs. Uh, but I think that Nonagon Infinity, this was when they really hit their peak. Like, this is such a spotless album. It's also an infinite loop, uh, which is another kind of uh, gizzardism that I think is really fun. Uh, you don't get that on the vinyl. It just fades out on both sides. And uh, yeah, that's unfortunate, but you're not going to get an infinite loop on a vinyl, uh, not in a locked groove. It's not going to go back to the first song on the album, but that's fine. I don't mind still. Having this album is good enough for me uh, because every single one of these songs is amazing. Uh, it also looks really, really cool as well. Uh, it has this cool uh, green and black splatter. I think that this is my favorite of uh, the Gizzard vinyl colors uh, that I have so far. So yeah, Nonagon Infinity. Uh, I think that this was their peak as a band. And I don't know if they're going to be able to reach kind of this height of uh, creativity and quality again. I'm not sure. Uh, but, you know, it was fun while it lasted. And uh, this album is, uh, it's, it's really the best that King Gizzard has to offer. Next up, I do feel like I'm severely lacking in rap albums in my collection, and uh, that's disappointing to me, uh, but I do want to have, you know, some stuff by my favorite rapper, uh, MF Doom, and that's why I was very excited uh, to get a copy of the final album by KMD. Now, for those of you who don't know, a KMD, or Causing Much Damage, was the rap trio that Doom was in with his brother Subrock uh, before Subrock's uh, untimely passing, and actually it was his death that postponed the release of this album alongside uh, the cover art and the title. Uh, frankly, I don't even feel comfortable saying the title, uh, but the music itself is, uh, if you're into Doom and if you want to hear Doom before Doom was Doom, uh, then this album is, uh, I think, the best time capsule of that era of his life. And uh, in case you're curious about, like, why it's so small, uh, that's because this isn't really a vinyl. Uh, the album itself comes on a CD. If you, it's, uh, it's also a book, so if you open it up, uh, you'll see the album itself is on a CD. And they also have an extra disc with some bonus tracks and instrumentals. And there is a vinyl here, and I will get to that. Uh, but the main reason I got it is because of this pop-up here. It's a pop-up book. I love that. I love that. This is why I love, you know, the medium of uh, vinyl, because it allows you to get really creative with how you express and present your album. And uh, this is incredible stuff. You know, it has the, the logo for the album. Uh, it has, you know, the full title, uh, which once again, 
I don't really feel comfortable saying. But still, uh, having this and being able to hear Doom in this era of his life is really cool. And it does have a vinyl in it. Uh, it has a 7-inch picture disc uh, with a bonus track on it. And uh, I know that there are a lot of vinyl collectors out there that really don't like picture discs. They think it sounds uh, a lot worse, and uh, I totally get that. Uh, I have had some picture discs before that I'm not really happy with. And uh, this one sounds fine to me, though, uh, and I'm happy to have it. Even if it is a picture disc, I think it looks great, I think it sounds great, and uh, I don't really have a problem with it. So yeah, KMD, uh, this was Doom back when he was Zev Love X, and I think that this was his best work uh, during that era of his life. All right, next up, we've got uh, this wonderful, uh, huge electronic album from uh, The Knife, uh, Shaking the Habitual. This is a triple album of epic proportions. Uh, it features what I think is uh, some of the best songs to come out of The Knife and Fever Ray. I love everything that The Knife has done, everything that they're associated with. And I think that Shaking the Habitual is my favorite record of theirs. And so I was super happy to have it, especially when it comes in a package that's this huge. It's quite heavy. Uh, it's three separate records, and one side is entirely devoted to that ambient piece. Not a huge fan of that ambient piece, uh, but I do think it's interesting to listen to it uh, in the context of the album. Uh, and it also has this really cool poster thing. So if we open this up here... So it has this really strange comic, and uh, I haven't actually read this all the way through, but it does also have uh, some lyrics on the back here. And I really like how they did this, this kind of strange, disorienting, bright pink packaging. Uh, it perfectly fits the disorienting nature of the music. It's kind of like how a cover art, when you can say, oh, that looks how the album sounds, uh, that is shaking the habitual. This definitely looks like how the record sounds. And so if you're not familiar with The Knife, uh, you've got to hear this, or at least you've got to hear the song uh, Tooth for an Eye. I think that that's one of my favorite songs. And so, yeah, very, very good album. Uh, it is really, really long, uh, especially with that 20-minute ambient composition. Uh, but regardless, it's a great album. Very happy to have it. Love the knife. Love everything that they do. And uh, yeah, this next one, uh, I knew I had to have it as soon as I started my record collection uh, because it's To Pimp a Butterfly. I mean... Another one, like what can be said about To Pimp a Butterfly that hasn't already been said? It's universally considered to be one of the best albums ever made, and I'm not going to try and disagree with that. I did actually plan on making a uh, To Pimp a Butterfly album breakdown someday, uh, and I, w I will do that someday. You can hold me to that. Uh, but for now, I think just being able to have this, you know, as a part of the collection, I knew it was something that I really wanted to do. Uh, considering this is an album that is so significant and so important. Uh, but even taken out of, you know, the context, uh, the impact that this album has had on society, it's just fantastic music. I think this is Kendrick at his absolute peak. And so, yeah, it's one of my favorite albums. It's one of everyone's favorite albums. Uh, so, yeah, having it in the collection uh, was definitely a necessity for me. And the packaging here is pretty cool, how they have, uh, if you open it up, uh, it just has the credits here, but it also has... You probably can't see it that well, but at the bottom here, it has Braille. Uh, and the Braille, uh, it says, I believe it says an open letter uh, by Kendrick Lamar. I'm not sure. I'd probably have to look that up uh, after I film this. But I think that having that, that Braille there with the full title of the album, kind of similar to what he did for Good Kid, Mad City, where it was a short film uh, by Kendrick Lamar. I thought that was nice. So yeah, To Pimp a Butterfly, it's, it's To Pimp a Butterfly. Yeah. Next up, we've got quite a few albums uh, by uh, one of my favorite classic rock bands. Uh, it's Led Zeppelin. And uh, I don't know uh, if I'm allowed to show the cover art here, uh, considering it does have a slight amount of nudity, uh, but it is Houses of the Holy. Uh, I think this is one of their best. Not enough people talking about how good Houses of the Holy is. And uh, it's just, it's a spectacular record that it, I, I wouldn't say it's underrated because it does have some songs that are very highly acclaimed, you know, Over the Hills and Far Away, the song remains the same. But still, uh, I feel like when it comes to, you know, comparing it to the number albums to Physical Graffiti, there are just not enough people talking about how great this record is. Uh, cool uh, paper sheet here. It is actually, it's paper. It's not supposed to be some, like, uh, some thin, flimsy sleeve here. It's actually like a solid, uh, thick sheet of almost like cardboard that has the lyrics on it. And uh, the record itself uh, is just plain black, as with all of the other uh, Led Zeppelin ones that I have. But still, House of the Holy, uh, wonderful record. 
uh, if you're into Led Zeppelin and uh, if you're not too uh, well versed in their stuff after the number records, uh, I think that House of the Holy is my favorite album uh, post one through four. And speaking of which, uh, here's one through four. Uh, so starting with their debut, uh, this is uh, a great way to start their career. Uh, not their finest. Uh, it does have a couple tracks on there that I'm not a huge fan of. And I also think it relies a lot on uh, the cover songs that have made Led Zeppelin kind of polarizing, notorious. But honestly, songs like uh, Good Times, Bad Times, Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You, Dazed and Confused. It's, it's just, it, it's a great debut in every sense of the word. So yeah, having that. Very cool. Very, very cool album. And uh, also Led Zeppelin 2. It's insane that they released this the same year as Led Zeppelin 1, because not only are both of them excellent albums, but they're so drastically different from each other. So hearing that these were made and released just a few months apart from each other is incredible to me. And uh, this next one is different. So it's, uh, it's Led Zeppelin 3, uh, but this one is uh, a bit more complicated than the others, because uh, this is the, uh, the, the deluxe version of it. And it has this kind of spinning wheel here where you can spin the cover art. And it has these uh, kind of die cut holes in the center. Wow. I love that they I love that they did that. And I wish that they did some of, some of that for some of their other albums, uh, but still Led Zeppelin 3, uh, even though this isn't one of their best, I think that having it, you know, for that uh, deluxe version for the extra disc that has some of the bonus tracks, uh, it's very very cool. And it also has this massive triple gatefold. I love that. I think that the weird uh, kind of disjointed art style that they went for on this record. It translates well, really over, um, sorry, it translates really well over to uh, the vinyl. Looks great. Love this album. Uh, love this band. And I think that this is a really cool album, regardless of uh, the albums that came before and after it. And then, of course, Led Zeppelin IV, uh, another kind of indisputable classic album. Uh, even if it's my, not my favorite of theirs, uh, it's one of those that you, you can't say no to Led Zeppelin for. They really nailed it this time around. And uh, each of these eight songs uh, really shaped classic rock uh, for that generation and for generations to come. So yeah, Led Zeppelin 4, uh, another one that I got really early on uh, in my collecting. Uh, this was one of the first, I think, 10 or 20 uh, because it's just that important of an album. I knew that when I started the collection, uh, this was one that needed to be there. Now, this next one is another one that I'm not actually a huge fan of, uh, but I saw it for uh, a very cheap price at uh, another local record store of mine, and so I figured it would be cool to have. It's, uh, it's John Lennon and Yoko Ono with Double Fantasy, and I think that both John Lennon and Yoko Ono have had uh, several better albums uh, with the Plastic Ono Band and uh, with Yoko with Fly, uh, but still, Double Fantasy, hearing these two on an album together, I think they did a good job with it. So, uh, yeah. Great record. Uh, it's got some quality tracks on it, uh, even though I think both of them have done better. Uh, it's really cool to hear them on an album together uh, at the kind of, you know, peak of their uh, creative evolution, at the peak of their relationship, when they were both, you know, so passionate about their art and about each other. And uh, they put all of that onto this album, and they did a great job with that. All right, just a few more, and then we'll be done for the day. Uh, but we have two by uh, noise rock duo Lightning Bolt. First up, Hyper Magic Mountain. Uh, what an album. I mean, this. I don't think this is their best. Uh, personally, more of a wonderful Rainbow fan. But, I mean, wow. This is just one of those albums that leaves you speechless every time you hear it. It's one of the loudest, most, like, relentless albums I've ever heard. And uh, for that reason, I just find it irresistible. And it features a lot of their best songs, uh, to me at least, uh, Tomorrow Morrowland, Captain Caveman, Mega Ghost, especially Dead Cowboy, the centerpiece of the album. Uh, there's a live performance of Dead Cowboy uh, that they did, I think it was in Japan, and they stretched it out to 10 minutes, and it's one of the greatest live performances of any song I've ever seen. I actually, I linked that in the description uh, if you want to go watch that. It's truly, like, speechless kind of stuff. Like, I just, I can't stop thinking about that, like, 10-minute Dead Cowboy performance. It's wonderful. So yeah, great album. And uh, great packaging, too. Uh, so it has this little art sheet here. Uh, some very cool uh, kind of, you know, scribbly artwork that goes along with the cover art here. And uh, it also comes on a nice uh, double vinyl. Uh, this one's actually red. Uh, it's a red and black splatter. I love that. Uh, and it's not like splatters all over. Uh, it's just on the edges. And I think that's cool that they did that. 
And uh, the D side is also etched. And I don't know if because of the lighting, I don't think you can see that very well. Uh, no, no, I guess not. Uh, but the D side, uh, it does have some etchings on it, some very faint ones. Uh, but it's very cool that they did that. And uh, speaking of cool packaging, uh, there are other, uh, another great album of theirs, uh, Ride the Skies. Now, this one is a lot shorter, a lot more concise, a lot more simple, uh, but just as brutal and relentless. And uh, the packaging here is also really cool. So it actually folds open like this to reveal uh, the contents on the inside. You take the sleeve out here and you're left with all of this. Got this kind of trifold thing with uh, some credits and a thank you note that I believe was written by uh, Brian Chippendale himself. And uh, going into the sleeve here, uh, we have an alternate cover art as well. Uh, that looks really, really cool. And uh, the vinyl itself is uh, its a bright blue uh, with some very faint splatters of uh, some black and white there. Uh, this one sounds uh, so heavy. Now, I like the sound of the Hyper Magic Mountain one, but Ride the Skies, it's like a whole new experience on vinyl. And oftentimes, I don't see, like, huge differences between Digital Masters and, and vinyl, but with Ride the Skies, it absolutely applies to this. Shout out to Lightning Bolt and Thrill Jockey for delivering some fantastic pressings of fantastic albums. All right, we're coming up on the 30-minute uh, time limit here, uh, so we're going to have one more. Uh, it's Lil Wayne's The Carter Three. Now, this is an album that, um, no, you, if you know me, you might not know, uh, like, how attached I am to this album, but I am very much attached to this album. This is a record that is very, very special to me, uh, to my growth as both a person and a musician. Uh, this was one of the first albums that I actually, like, really loved. I think I first heard it when I was, like, uh, eight or nine, uh, thinking about like the lyrics of the album, I realize now that that's probably terrible. But I first heard this album uh, in like elementary school or something. I didn't know much about music at the time, but I had heard some uh, some Lil Wayne songs uh, from some friends of mine. I heard it in video games. And so I was like, who is this guy? And I remember looking up on iTunes uh, back when iTunes was the primary uh, form of streaming. And I actually bought uh, Lil Wayne's uh, The Carter 3 and The Carter 4 uh, with my own money, and I was just, I was in love with this album. I don't even know why. I don't know what it was about this that captivated me so much. I think it was his voice, uh, because, you know, Lil Wayne has a very distinct, uh, irreplaceable voice, and so I found that really interesting, and I also loved uh, the instrumentals, uh, especially the song Amelie. I remember I could not stop listening to Amelie, and so when I heard that uh, the wonderful folks over at Vinyl Me Please were doing a pressing of this album, I realized, you know, for nostalgia's sake and also because this is still such a great album, uh, that I really wanted to have it in the collection. So this is a, a Vinyl Me Please pressing, and I'm not subscribed uh, to Vinyl Me Please. It's a subscription service uh, that delivers new records every month. I would love to get it, uh, but uh, no, I, I did not subscribe to it uh, to get this. They do have a thing where... Um, after the records of the month are no longer the records of the month, uh, they put them up on their web store for a short amount of time. Uh, they put up the spare copies for people to buy. And uh, that was how I got a uh, hold of this. And I am so, so grateful that I did because this, it sounds excellent on vinyl and it's also just so cool to have an album that I care about so much. Anyways, uh, let's just take a look at the packaging here. Uh, so we start with uh, this stencil here. What's a goon to a goblin? And uh, I love that they did that that stencil there. It looks so cool. I love that font uh, that they chose for that. I don't have any other uh, Vinyl Me Please records that have a stencil in them. And so I think that this is one of the coolest things uh, that I have uh, in a vinyl record. And uh, when it comes to the record itself, it's a super deep uh, red and black. That's probably so deep it's hard to see. Uh, but it looks uh, so cool. And uh, it sounds great as well. I think that, you know, the mixing, the production on this record, it sounded so, um, sounded so pristine for its time. And there's a reason that this album was so beloved both by fans and by critics. It's because it sounds unlike anything else that was made at the time. And it sounds really, really good on vinyl. And so if you do find yourself, you know, looking for some great rap albums to add to the collection, if you are a Lil Wayne fan, uh, and if you can get the Vinyl Me Please pressing of the Carter Three, uh, you should definitely get this pressing because it's the best thing that a Lil Wayne fan could ask for. So uh, I think that'll do it for this part of the uh, Vinyl Collection series. Uh, we did go over uh, the 30 minute time limit. I'm sorry about that. 
I'm sure that I was rambling for a very long time uh, about the Carter 3. But yeah, that'll do it for this. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, I will be uploading uh, part six uh, tomorrow. I know that usually I do it immediately after this one, but I do have some other things that I have to attend to with creating other videos, uh, as well as just some personal things to attend to. So I won't uh, be having any time to create uh, part six until tomorrow, uh, but it will go up and I'm so excited to share the rest of the collection with you. Uh, thank you all so much for watching and I hope you all have a very nice day.